Uh, so it's good to see you all uh, bright and early. Um, so uh, I'm going to kind of uh, jump right in. I'll give a, a brief introduction to the Bay Area lecture series. Um, but uh, first, I'll introduce myself. My name is Damien Rose. I think probably a lot of you know me because of just because I've been around for a while. Um, so I've been involved in a lot of medical education pursuits, and I also am the medical director of the PATH program for early psychosis. Um, but what I want to talk to you today about um, is a little bit more of bigger picture. Um, and I, I choose these bigger picture talks usually early on in the series because I, I want to I help frame some of the discussions that, in particular with the department's focus on justice and equity, that I think are in the background of this diagnostic specificity paradigm that we all kind of grew up in. Um, and how we might think about not just the logical problems with it, but how it may actually reinforce structural bias at a fundamental level. Um, and so what I wanted to talk about today was really challenging some of the assumptions that underlie our expertise. Um, and I'm gonna be a little hard on our field, that's the Grinch. Um, but uh, I also wanna end with just some of the ways where we've been gathering tons of epidemiological data over the past 50 years. So it's not like we don't have different paths forward. So I want us to think just a little bit about a different way to think about behavioral disturbance across the lifespan than what we what I would call the diagnostic specificity paradigm. Um, um, I'll just ask everybody in the audience, in particular the senior faculty, I include myself in this, to just catch yourself when you notice a yes but. Um, so I'm going to point out some things that I think we all kind of recognize about our field as problems, um, but we often, because we're just in it and it's sort of what we do and we we, uh, you know, we, 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 we are experts, but we also want to feel like experts. I think we often respond to some of the criticisms with these kind of really two, I'm going to call them two quick yes buts. I'll give you some examples, all of which I've had in my mind. I often find myself saying this one. Well, I don't blindly apply it, right? I don't do that, right? What if, what if the whole frame makes us blindly uh, apply it, right? Uh, or this one. I didn't know if that was really true, right? I'm like, well, we acted like it was true. Or this one, this is a newer one, I think because overprescribing is becoming a bigger identified problem. I think we're blaming primary care now, which is basically just saying they see the lion's share of the people, so it's their fault. Um, but our folks need medication. Um, so just check yourself with these because I'm going to, because a lot of the things I'm going to talk about go at the heart of this idea that you're gonna to come to me, I'm gonna to talk to you and assess an underlying psychopathological deficit that exists within you, and I'm gonna specifically correct it. That's, that's in a sense, I think that's a little bit of the conceit of our field is the extent to which we use that in our language. Um, this is technically the second lecture in the Bay Area lecture series. So Steve Hinshaw kicked us off. Uh, he did a nice job, I thought, of talking about how even, even in sort of a quote unquote simple syndrome like ADHD, I mean, simply defined, uh, you can see how uh, gender equity issues cut across assessments and diagnosis and treatment. And so I want that kind of, that, that theme to be in the background here as well. The primary purpose of this lecture series is to showcase our own. Um, I've expanded it this year to include uh, local patient advocates. Um, um, and really the goal here is to promote collaboration between folks in the greater Bay Area. Of course, people at this institution, but also people nearby. And in line uh, for the last several years, in line with the department schools, uh, uh, we've been just trying to guide presenters to just think a little bit about viewing their work through the lenses of social environmental justice and racial justice and equity. And I say this, nobody needs to be considered an expert in this issue in the sociology of this issue, but just really thinking about how whatever topic you're talking about, what are the assumptions, what is the language, and how does it relate to some of the ways in which different people get treated differently in our system. Um, um, you already caught the Grinch theme. Um, so I want to introduce you to uh, my Grinch hat. Um, so uh, this is a hat that uh, I probably didn't have a name for until a couple of years ago. Um, I grew up in the 90s, so that's why I say uh, the Grinch who stole the decade of the brain, if folks remember that. Um, but I was super excited about psychiatry. I still am. I don't want that point to get lost. I'm stuck in. I'm here for good. Um, but one of the things that I realized was this kind of just growing in the back of my mind that maybe we were a little bit too smug as a field, not people, not the individual people I was meeting, as a field, just the way that we talked about quote unquote mental illness just struck me as a, like, we're saying things that I'm not sure we can back up. Yeah. And. Oh. 
Of course. Of course. Yeah. Oh, I agree with that. And when, hopefully when I talk about the trap of meaning, I'll talk about that as a, as a general human uh, sort of cognitive bias. Um, but I just think the stakes are high in our field. Um, and so I want us to be aware that the stakes are high uh, for, for this type of problem. Um, so if, if you're a trainee, uh, listen, you've probably, heard, you've probably heard me put my Grinch hat on. I probably said something like this to you. Uh, this would just be an example of the Grinch speaking. All right. Um, again, not that they're not helpful, but we shouldn't pretend that they're super helpful, right? That's my Grinch hat, right? Um, and so I wanna to just, to set the context, I wanna give you a couple sort of points along my development where I, I was able to take the Grinch in and make sense of it and think a little bit more productively about it. So I wanna give you just two personal stories that relate to this experience. So, so story one is very early in my training. So you know, I, my badge says MD, PhD. I had a PhD in cell biology in another life. Right? So I came here uh, with a lot of uh, basic science training. And so people would often you know, ask me, what's the PhD for? And I'd say cell biology. And they'd say, and some version of this question, you know, what's been your experience of psychiatry after being an, uh, a PhD cell biologist? And what was struck me is how quickly this answer came to me, right? right. And I want to tell you what I didn't mean and what I did mean. What I didn't mean is that we didn't do a good job of trying to understand mental phenomenon, that we, were, we weren't thoughtful and that we didn't conduct good research. In fact, part of the reason I like this field is, is we got a lot of really cool, really well done research. That was not what I meant. What I meant was more at the higher level, the assumptions that were informing us. And I just thought we're kind of awful at critical reasoning around our precepts. Now, a lot of this is just a problem with psychology in and of itself is that we have slippery language and we allow ourselves to slip around without noticing we're doing it. Um, but really um, what I noticed very early on in my training is a lot of these diagnostic discussions were settled with an argument from authority, right? So an authority figure would say, no, I think it's this. Um, and, and I know that happens everywhere. Again, I think this is a typical human phenomenon when you introduce hierarchies. But, but what I've come to realize more recently is that I think the way DSM sets up diagnosis, it can only be discriminated by argument from authority, right? So that's the only way to discriminate diagnostic disagreements. And I think that's a problem. Um, story two is a little bit later in my training. I was very interested in medical education and uh, I applied for associate uh, residency training director. I can't remember if this was the first time or the second time. The first time I didn't get it, so maybe it's because I gave this answer. But uh, uh, I applied to psychiatry residency training. Um, and you know, this is a typical question that you get whenever you're applying for a job like this. What would you change? What would you disrupt? Um, and, and I answered this, Grinch came on, right? Um, and I wanna get, I wanna tell you what I didn't mean. I wanna tell you what I mean. What I didn't mean is there were no meaningful expertise in psychiatry. In fact, I really appreciated folks who came last time when the technology failed us and, and gave some thoughtful responses about what you thought your expertise was. A lot of them were verbal communication, interestingly, where they centered around communication even outside of the doctor-patient relationship. So I didn't mean there was no meaningful expertise, but what I meant is this, I'll let you read it for yourselves. And th this one still kind of bothers me. Just seemed like a lot of time spent or something about which we know remarkably little. Um, and, and, and of course, in basic science, that's the goal, right? I know very little about this and I'm gonna take this small piece of it and try to understand it. But at the level of a precept or an assumption or a, a paradigm or a frame, I found this very problematic how much time, and it's just think about it, your everyday language, right? We're gonna treat the anxiety component of this illness with an SSRI. That's non-verifiable, non-falsifiable. We'll come back to that, right? But that's the language that we use. And so I want us to be careful. That, so that's what I mean. It's, it's not so much that these biases don't cut across other aspects of medicine as human beings. It's that the stakes are pretty high here. And we should be aware of how these intersect with structural biases and who comes to care and who gets in particular over-treatment is something I've become very concerned about, who gets over-treatment. Um, and so here are my learning objectives. I'll list them for you. I'll let you read them. We'll walk through them one by one. Again, hopefully we'll end with a different way of thinking and moving forward. So it was nicely pointed out that some the, the biases I'm talking about are human biases, right? And one of the human biases that cuts across 
behavior is what we call the trap of meaning. The trap of meaning is pretty, pretty simple to define. And it's basically how when we're presented with remarkably complex phenomenon, we tend to seek, you might call it an explanation that is meaningful or tightly associated, and we call it causal, right? So we take a, we take a meaning explanation and we turn it into a causal explanation. And I'm just gonna give just a simple example here. There are lots of examples, but let's say, I don't know why this doesn't, this wants to move on, I apologize. Let, let's say that um, I had a bad day and I was really grumpy one day, right? And let's say the night before I didn't sleep well, that would actually probably be a simple trap of me. I'd say, oh, I'm grumpy because I didn't sleep well. That actually wouldn't be too bad from a causal standpoint because we have data linking sleep to irritability. Can I prove that's what's happened? No, but for, at the good enough explanation, it's not too bad. But, but the, you can see how these start to become more culturally biased as you get to these larger and larger and more complex phenomena. What if I'm an angry person? What if I'm irritable every day? Does that mean I'm not sleeping well every night? Right? What's the what's the what's a good enough explanation for? And and you can see the the more and more complicated we get, the more and more we tend to fall back on it's just something inside you that is pathological. Right? And I'm not saying that couldn't be true. I'm just saying that's a, that's a trap of meaning that often falls into psychiatry. And then in the last example in the upper right, what if I had command auditory hallucinations telling me to be mean to people, and that's why I was grumpy? Right? Then then what would our what would our good enough explanation for that be? It probably wouldn't be sleep. Right? It would probably start to become a more complicated DSM-like kind of explanation. So I just want to, I want to point this out, the more complicated the phenomena, and in particular, if you want to put it in cultural terms, the weirder right, or the less statistically common the phenomenon, the more you'll start to see people reaching for these what we call underlying explanations and then treating them as causes. That's the slip that I want us to be careful about. We're taking a meaning explanation and we're slipping it into a causal explanation in a framework that says I have a specific treatment for that specific cause. That's where I think this, this logic train leads to a lot of clinical outcomes. Um, and so I think this is, this is one of the questions I always, I always think to myself whenever I hear arguments about what, it, what the real diagnosis is. I think in some extent we're arguing over what's a good enough explanation for this person's behavior. Um, and I think in psychiatry, even though DSM doesn't explicitly address this, my experience is that we often have this kind of two-step process when we talk to people. We have a first step, which is related to the trap of meaning, which we all do. I think we do this implicitly. Are the circumstances that preceded this diagnosis meaningful? Meaning, do, do I, can I make sense of them? Can I develop a level of understanding? Because it's a high level of understanding, a high level of understanding about how cause and effect from an environmental or external standpoint might have led to this. And that's usually, usually the clinicians, you'll hear us argue about these, right? right? Sometimes we even insert our own biases, like I wouldn't be angry at that, right? We start to do that kind of argument. Right? Or who wouldn't hear that? Who wouldn't be sad? Who wouldn't be sad if that happened? Um, but I think what we do in step two is that if we don't have a high level of uh, 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 external understanding, instead of saying it's external, we say well, it must be an underlying biological psychopathological process. We jump straight to that. Um, so I want to see see what we're doing is I don't have a good enough explanation. Think about all the cultural biases packed into what's how much time I have to spend with you, what context we're in, how you come to me, what are my assumptions about you. If I can't quote unquote talk myself into a good enough explanation, then it's way more likely you have a biological psychopathological process that understand that under uh, underlies is the word we often use your behavior. Um, and the problem with this is it gets really really hard in psychiatry to find proximal life events being tightly associated with our behavioral syndromes. This doesn't mean stress isn't important and. Childhood stress is going to be very important from a causal standpoint. I'm not going to talk about that too much until the end. But in the way that we often develop a level of understanding, you lost your job, you broke up with your girlfriend. I see this a lot with folks I see who are in college, right? So they talk about, you know, again, I'm not trying to minimize the stressor. They're just typical college stressors, right? I see those as, as explanatory. But what, what it makes me think is how much work am I putting into to find an explanation? Who do I do that for and who do I not? Uh, how much work am I putting in and why? Because I think this is really kind of a say what. I, I still struggle with it. It just doesn't make sense to me, right? It doesn't make sense to me. And I want to show you what the, this, this data, Ken Kendler has been interested in this. He, he's another one who puts a little bit of a Grinch hat on, if you know Ken Kendler. Um, uh, he's the genetic Grinch. But, um, but uh, this was a very simple study, and it just kind of got at how we sort of make assumptions. And so, so basically they just had people with major depressive disorder and they had clinicians rate a low level of understanding or a high level of understanding, right? So does it quote unquote make sense 
that you're depressed right now, usually based upon life events. That's usually what the level of understanding was. And the hypothesis I think that we all oper uh, operate under is pretty straightforward. And that is that if, you, if I had a high level of understanding, then maybe you are somebody who quote unquote was less likely to develop depression. Otherwise, you needed an, you needed an extra burden of stressors and maybe you have less genetic load. Like, so your people in your family are less likely to have depression, twins are less likely to have depression, et cetera. So it, it's, it's, it's the kind of anybody could be pushed over the edge. And the other hypothesis is that the people where I don't have a high level, of, it kind of came out of nowhere, those folks are gonna be the opposite, right? They're gonna be the people with more childhood risk factors and more genetic load. The problem was really they're all equally likely. So now here's, but here's the trick here that I want us to struggle with because for folks who are aware of the patient alliance data, I think there's a similarity here. The patient alliance data, so alliance is a very powerful finding in psychotherapy, but it's the patient's rating of alliance that's a powerful finding, not the clinician's rating of alliance. So I wonder if part of what's happening here is a similar phenomenon, is that my level of understanding may actually not map well onto what the stressors are and what the actual, and what the actual causal explanation, the externalized causal, causal explanation might be. That's my fear what might be explaining this. But at the level of what we can do as clinicians, what this data tells me is we have to be really careful, right? Because we do the split, I would say we should do neither. We should neither say, I know these set of external experiences were causal for you. We shouldn't do that. Of course, we make meaning out of them. We care about them and we try to change people's stress levels. And if we can't find a high level of understanding, we should use that as evidence that I've now found something else, which is what DSM, this is where I think DSM pushes us, is it pushes us to do this, uh, this kind of process. So it kind of has this kind of two-part question. Is this the reaction understandable? And how hard do I look for understandability is an important question. Um, if it's normal, you might call it surface level distress. If I understand it, it's more likely to be called that. Um, if, if I can't understand it, then it's abnormal. And usually we put this extra caveat on it that, well, if, if, if it's abnormal, it's probably due to some underlying psychopathology. That's that word. I like to see this word underlie comes up again and again and again. I wanna, I wanna hone in on this word underlie because it's. I think we say it all the time, um, all the time. Um, and not just as an underlying, but, but also it's specific and stable. That's another thing that, that the DSM diagnostic specificity paradigm kind of assumes in its treatment, that this is a specific deficit, it's separate from other deficits and it's largely stable over time. So you are a type of, this is a type of dysfunction that we should manage over time for you. That's, that's, that's how we often use, and that's how our clinics are set up. Right? That's how all our specialty clinics are set up with that assumption in mind. Andrea. Yeah, please. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, you know, I honestly think that developmentally, as we mature, we might actually have a different understanding of the two steps or a different way we're practicing. What do you think? Are you going to talk about that? Because I think step two is way more complex now that I'm 20 years in. Yeah. For me, if I can't find some, if something doesn't make sense, I will continue to look for it. But I have the luxury of having figured out, I don't know, yeah. The other part, do you know what I mean? No, I, I thank you for that, Andrea. So I, I, I have like a hundred slides in my slide graveyard. So it, it, uh, this is, it's not something I'm gonna have time to touch on today. I'm gonna touch at the very end a little bit about how we think about expertise. My fear, I agree with you. I feel like, I feel like this is less of a problem for people who've been humbled, right? And, and really struggled with people over long periods of time. I think longitudinally treating folks argues against some of these assumptions. So you kind of learn but I do worry that the, the paradigm that we exist in, that we're trained in, that is our language, actually fights against that type of expertise. That's my fear. It actually impedes it as opposed to enriches it. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So literally highlighting that some of the issues you're bringing up are inherent to to medicine again to the human yeah. condition and that if anything we should be more teaching about that to your question about training but i think that um by the way krupman said something like i'm making no comments about psychiatry which is very stigmatizing but so do you like i, I think 
it sounds like you want to talk specifically about psychiatry. I do. And so do you feel like what you're saying is that there are cultural elements or, or nomenclature elements or model <sighs> elements that make this worse or arrives through a different route that I think a situation there are, there are, that's inherent there are in medicine? A couple things that make it worse. I mean, they're at the larger level of how psychiatry is split from medicine. But I just want to talk about us as psychiatrists using that language. So certainly the problem of reification of a syndrome cuts across medicine, but that's, that's not unique to us, which is part of what we're talking about here. But, but I want to give, I'll give a couple of examples of how I think DSM in the way that it frames things actually makes those biases worse. And, and if we don't recognize that, certainly nobody in my training ever had me recognize the things I'm going to tell you is like, cause I taught DSM diagnosis and I actually read the DSM, which none of the trainees would, by the way, but I actually read the DSM and they have to address this and they address it in an, I would say awfully. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I mean. And so, so they have to justify it, but they justify it in a way that I don't think other branches of medicine would justify. And I think it has to do because it's an expertise that you can frame in the world. This is my fear. And I'm, I, I, I'm here, I, I can't tell you for sure, but I worry there's a lack of humility. And so I'm going to just dive right in. As you know, I like to be a little bit um, uh, challenging. Um, so I've come up with, uh, some of the trainees might have, might have heard me say this, uh, uh, I, 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 I'll just call it my rule because I, I don't want to give this to anybody else if, if it angers people. But I found that this rule actually applies pretty well. This is the undiplomatic version. Uh, when somebody puts the word real or underline in front of a DSM diagnosis, screen chat, there's a very good chance they have absolutely no idea what they're talking about, right? And what I mean is it's not that they're not smart or that they ha don't have a lot of experience, or they're not telling me something useful. It's that at the level that they're using the words real or underlying, there's no way to verify or falsify that claim, right? And so that, and, and it's a language that's kind of given to, we don't even think about it, we just start using this. I'll give you the, organic is the older version of this, right? Yeah, uh, um, um, the diplomatic version though, because I want us to dive into this, yeah, so it's the, the Grinch whose heart starts to grow, um, is that they're just, if somebody puts real or underlined, they're making a causal claim that cannot be falsified or verified, only asserted through authority. Now, if I have a ton of clinical experience, asserting through authority may be helpful. It's not a terrible thing to do, right? If you have a supervisor who's been working 20 years with a patient population and they give you an opinion because there's no time for them to back it up, it's not like you shouldn't trust that. They may actually make good predictions, right? My fear is more at the level of how we have a dialogue as a field, if none of us can verify or falsify when we decide this is real psychosis or not, for example, in my world, then what does that say? It just means, who, it just means who's got this kind of bigger title, right? Or, or the more influence, for example, or some other cultural factors. Um, and so I think, so it brings up the question, none of us want to do this. Again, I'm not, I don't, when I say our field gets a little bit smug about this, I don't mean the clinicians are smug. Um, so why do we do this? And I think it's because really we've, we've convinced ourselves that tautology is causality. Um, and and we, there's a little bit of circular reason thrown in for good measure. And I'll tell you, and, and where, where you really start to notice this is if you interrogate DSM's definitions of a mental disorder. Um, and, and so there's, the, the, first of all, it says the lack of a known cause is a cause, already problematic, but this is, this is what we say. It's a weird thing to say. Sometimes we don't stop and just think how weird that is to say. Um, but, and, and we all know that that doesn't make sense, but again, our language behaves as if that's true. And I, I'll give you some examples. The, the first time I noticed this, I was teaching DSM-4, this was a while ago. And so, you know, you have to teach what, you, you teach second, every, every category has a secondary to a general medical condition. Of course, all the trainees say, what counts as a general medical condition, right? The general in front of it doesn't make much sense. Um, and so what, what I noticed really quickly was that we actually do something very different to your point, Anne, very different about what uh, other branches of medicine would do with syndrome. So in the rest of medicine, there's tons of syndromes. Right? Migraine's a syndrome. It's not, it's not like medicine knows all the causes and we don't. That's not a useful distinction. But what they do is if, if they think a migraine, let's say caused by hypertension, they would call it hypertension-induced migraine. If, if they didn't know what caused it, it would still be a migraine. Right? They would still think of it as a downstream process that was met, that, that some collusion of factors led to some similar outcome that was still a migraine. The phenomenon of a migraine still existed. We don't do that, and it's weird. Uh, what we do is 
if I, let's say I, I meet people with, I've, I've met a couple people in my life where I'd say your schizophrenia syndrome is better ex explained by some, lupus cerebritis is an example that comes to my mind. There aren't too many examples of simple causes that lead to schizophrenia, but this would be one. But the weird thing is then, then I would say, well, that's actually no longer schizophrenia. I'm like, why not? It's just schizophrenia caused by lupus cerebritis, right? It's still schizophrenia, but we play this game that somehow fundamentally it is now no longer schizophrenia. And if I can't find a cause, I actually insert a tautological cause. And I say, if it is schizophrenia, then it's due to a schizophrenic process, which is kind of a useless thing to say, but we say it all the time anyway. I'm gonna go after that because this is where I think we think so, so, but we treat that as a causal statement, which is very problematic um, because it leads us to then think we're, th that's a specific cause that we know something about specifically treating and we should specifically treat it because it's gonna be, it's a specific cause that's stable over time and we should specifically treat it over time. And when you look at the epidemiologic data I'm gonna show you later, that those assumptions do not hold up over long, long periods of time, even for our quote unquote severe disorders. Um, and so this, this is just some examples. I call this the super waffle, right? I, I talked about a general medical condition and I talked about a primary mental disorder. So, you know, so what, What's the difference between, basically the difference between them is that they're in a different book, right? I mean, that's the difference between them, right? You can't get them to say there's any difference between them. So basically what you've got is a mental disorder is defined by not being a general medical condition, which is defined by not being a mental disorder, right? That's, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, this is not me making it funny. This is, it's a page of this, but this is what it says at the end. Um, and so, you know, so you can see how my Grinch goes crazy with that one, right? But I just, so, so you can see what we're doing is we're, we're saying the lack of a cause is a cause and that cause is something that I can specifically assess and specifically treat. So it's almost like it's taking two opposite things at the same time. And I think that's problematic. Now DSM-5 interestingly doesn't talk about the difference between, I think that maybe the authors noticed that it wasn't defensible. Um, uh, but it does say this and I've, I've hammered this the last time I talked, I hammered this because I think this is where a lot of our bias creeps in, is that I think it actually starts fine. Like I'm okay with a mental disorder being a syndrome that's, clear, that's, that's described by these things that exists over time. You see it in populations, right? It's real in that sense. But then it throws this in, right? Without any information about what would guide you about what that underlying process is, right? Now, I guess, again, this is in a sense, this kind of has to be true, but it's tautologically true, right? I mean, I guess like if you're angry, why are you angry? Because your brain is angry. I mean, sort of, right? I mean, probably at some level, my brain is angry, but that you haven't given me any new information about anger. You've just put it back a step. And I think we do that a lot. Um, and the implication here, I'm not gonna talk too much about this, but I think this is where a lot of cultural biases come in, that there's this optimal brain <laughs> and that you're deviating in some, from some underlying way is the assumption here. And this is where I think you have to be, a lot of cultural biases can creep in here. And so, um, I think that's a pretty high stakes. So I'm saying, I'm not just saying this is a syndrome. I'm saying it's a syndrome that has a specific underlying causal explanation. Um, and so that's what I mean by the stakes are high, right? Because if that's true, then I'm gonna treat it very differently than if it's not true. Um, and, and did you raise your hand, Dan? I think that it's it's important to point out, especially for trainees, that it's it's almost like an anthropological situation, if you will, that reflects psychiatry's evolution from a certain mainstream mm -hmm. practice of it to currently not even reflecting the best of the research in our field, certainly. And we know that that's been very controversial and very upsetting to a lot of people. I think DSM-5 was a huge disappointment in terms of not incorporating things that would have made it better. But so I think that we, we need to be careful to, to reify that all psychiatrists, certainly in academia, are married to the DSM and, and, and use it without considerable uh, precautions or criticism. So like, I, I just want to put that out there. That I agree with that. And I, I don't, at the individual clinician level, that's why I put up the yes buts, right? At the individual clinician level, I think we all react against this. 
right? Or my experience has been that. Most people that I talk to recognize that. But there's, I think there's an implicit way that our language almost doesn't allow us to move to the next stage. In the way that we, I'm just, I'm, just, and I, I'm gonna ask all of you, next time you have a case discussion, just listen to the language around assumptions about causality and treatment. They are bound by the DSM, highly tightly bound, in, in a way that, in a way that acts like DSM disorders are specific entities that track through time separately from other entities and because we treat them that way. Um, and my, I do feel like we do a ton of overprescribing for that reason. That's where I think the stakes become high um, is that we cause a fair bit of harm. Well, we also, yeah. I mean, I would say an example of stakes that are high and harm would be that there, I think there is a documented over-focus on things that are DSM-ish. Mm -hmm. And so, take a patient on a unit that has depression and suicidality. I think a lot of people in the suicide field have tried to push for elements of suicidality in the DSM, mm -hmm. simply not, not claiming that it's, it's like a syndrome exactly, but, but it is, mm -hmm. but, but, but mostly because that is a way of making sure that something gets clinical attention. So attention. I, think, yeah. I think that's an example of harm is that there is certainly overvaluing in general of what is described. Yeah. And, and a real not. anchoring, like, but is that like an anchoring, like once I call it depression, then I start to focus on depression as the thing. Um, and that's it, one of the things that, uh, I learned this in psychosis early on, but I'm gonna show you some data that shows this longitudinally. Every DSM disorder predicts every other DSM disorder. There's very little movement within tracks of types of diagnosis. It's more like severity or not severity is the better marker. Um, and so anchor, anchor bias, I think, is another big problem that, that DSM leads us towards. Um, and so I, just besides, I mean, I often, because I get called in as an expert to make a diagnosis, I'm often put in the position where I do make a different diagnosis than what somebody else made a year ago, but it's not because the person a year ago was wrong. It's because diagnoses are unstable. I mean, that, that's what, it, it's not because I was the better expert. Um, and so, but, but I think that's how, that's how it gets heard by the field, is I got the right one. Now you get the right treatment as opposed to the diagnosis is just actually unstable. And we were both correct, uh, if you follow somebody long enough. Um, and so I, I just wanna point this, I, I think th th this is a high stake. So at the, at the level of asserting that there's a dysfunction in underlying processing, really, you know, I think really it's just our clinical training that DSM says is what, so, but, but I was thinking about my DSM, but like nobody, nobody helped me discern what an underlying psychopathological process was, but there was, there was this is what I mean, there's no falsifiability or verifiability in that. Um, and so it kind of starts to sound like, because we told you so, right? Because I pointed this, now again, I think experts will point out meaningful things, but the language in which we pointed out, I think actually is probably confusing to the trainee, right? This is real schizophrenia. Look at this person, this is real schizophrenia. This is real thought blocking, right? If I, don't, if I don't tell them what I mean, which is an observational standard, they're going to start to use their observations as indications of internal dysfunction, which I think you can see, so you can see how that process is already going to start to work. And this is, I'm, I'm going to, I talked more about this last year, but I just, I, I want to bring up just, I just want us to think about the steps at each of these steps, how a cultural bias overlay could cause problems, right? So there's an optimal brain that if you have a mental illness, you deviate from that optimal brain in a way that aligns perfectly with syndromal criteria. So I, I've defined I, the way you, you misalign. It's an underlying deficit that I can detect due to my training and needs to be specifically corrected. Um, often medications are necessary to correct it because underlying mental illness is more biological. That's another assumption we make. We, the trap of meaning often leads us to this, right? If it's in you, it must be more biological. Um, and maybe we treat severity with just, well, you, if you're more severe, you must just be more miswired and we may need to rewire you more. I think this explains a lot of polypharmacy. Um, and, and so, and just think about how each of those steps, each of those steps, who do you decide that that's true for? So this is my fear. I mean, I've stated this before, but I just, I, my fear is that when we apply DSM as it's intended to be applied, we're reinforcing structural bias. I know that we don't want to, and I know that when we reflect on it, it bothers us, but I still feel like if you're implying it as it's intended to be applied, that you reinforce these biases, right? So again, think about these questions. And this question, who needs medication? I always find that an interesting question. Right? What are you getting at? What do you mean needs medication? Is it gonna be helpful or not is the question, not do they need it. 
Right. And then sometimes I think about power and privilege, right? So just the people in this room, we have a lot of power. We don't think about it. We have a lot of power to reject a mental illness diagnosis, right? I can, I learned this very early on in psychodynamic theory class. If I could talk my way out of a bad behavior, I, I was given a password, right? Right. We're, we're very, you know, we can, we, in a, we have a power and a privilege to really be able to reject that we have underlying psychopathology because we have, we have good explanations for it. And just by, by virtue of our standing we're less likely to be given a diagnosis. No. So I mentioned the word tautology a couple of times. I just wanna point out how it plays out. And I worry that, again, I, it's not that I don't think psychiatry has an expertise. That I, have a, I have a problem with us being, I feel pushed into this expertise. And I feel like when I don't pay attention to it, I, I fall right into it. And this is, this is the expertise tautology. So if somebody comes to an expert, again, like me, I've been around 20 years, so I'm an expert. Um, and you know, they give me a, this is a difficult case. This is a complicated case. Right, and so I rule out some causal explanations that people had a question for, and then I say, "Oh, this is actually this actually is major depressive disorder. It's that you know they were using the word guilt instead of this, or they were they were you know de demoralized or something like." That. I give an explanation, and I say, "Well, and and I've ruled out medical conditions. So this is a non-general medical condition, medical disorder." And so, but now I've I've all of a sudden assumed, due to it's only my stamp of approval that this is now underlying depression. I, there's no other, I don't have to prove or disprove this at any, I don't even have to make a prediction. I just have to say, this is underlying depression. Um, but really, again, I haven't added any new or useful information whatsoever. If you think about it from a practical standpoint, in fact, I may have actually added some erroneous information. That's my fear. Um, and so if you think about totality as a redundancy, and I'll ask the trainees in the audience, listen for these. I bet I say this again, I'm not saying I'm immune to this, but you'll hear this, you'll hear tautologies framed as causality all the time once you start to notice it. Um, so just some easy examples, you'll hear some version of this. Again, the idea that there's a specific underlying deficit that leads to anxiety that you can pull out of a person's presentation and assume rec rec is an underlying anxiety deficit. Uh, we do this a lot when we use medications, right? We should give abuse bar to give, the worry component should be treated with abuse bar. Like what? Um, um, and then this one, just because I'm in the cognitive neuroscience world, this, this is the cognitive neuroscience way of doing the same thing, right? I mean, this doesn't give me any useful information, right? I, I don't have to verify or falsify what the impaired attentional processing is. Now, there are people studying that. So it's not like this is not a, this is a good scientific question. I'm saying at the level that we apply this, we assume a causality. And I, I promise this will be my last Grinchy moment. But just to make the point in a silly way, if I say as an expert, depression is due to an underlying process that I don't have to verify and that I don't, and it is not falsifiable, I haven't ruled out the depression fairy, right? I'm, and this is what I'm, this is the problem, right? So, so I haven't actually given you any new information that you can do anything with, other than my opinion that this is an underlying psychopathological deficit that is different from an optimal brain in a specific way that will track through time and that I can treat the deficit specifically. Right, that, that I've said all of that, but I don't have to. Uh, but but really, I've just said it's the depression thing, right? It's the depression thing that's caused that. So I, I promise that's my last cringe moment because I want to move on to thinking about what are different ways. How does the data lead us in a different direction? Um, and so this is just my word. I don't I don't want to say I'm an expert in this. This is newer data that I've just has really made me think. Um, and it's really, it's, it just made me think about what if, what if we thought about the system managing people over time and people going in and out of the system over time, as opposed to this consultation model we kind of have now, which is we need to find you the right expert to give you the right diagnosis and that'll set you up for years. Um, and, and, and we'll have done our part. Um, and so, you know, so, so I'm just gonna just remind us of what I call the diagnostic specificity paradigm. It kind of starts in the seventies, right? It kind of gets disseminated in the eighties. Right, and really, I, now this, you can't, I, again, this is about causality, so I can't say this is cause and effect, but it certainly correlates tightly with the rapid rise of prescriptions, which started takes off in the 1990s. Um, and so, and I wouldn't be upset with this if I thought more people were getting treatment and there's better outcomes, right? I wouldn't be so upset. It's not like I'm upset that there are more prescriptions, right? But what you find out is that a lot of things are still getting worse. This is just suicide trends over time. Right, so suicide is getting worse. Even people in care, this is veterans data. Look at the suicide rate on the right. These are people in care. These aren't people who didn't seek care, right? So, so I'm, not, this isn't, I'm not saying you can prove that, it's not, I'm not saying the diagnostic specificity problem paradigm caused this, 
but I would be less upset with it if the data suggested that it was making a large dent. The data doesn't suggest it's making a large dent. So, so it's not just that there are these logical problems with it, that it doesn't correlate with success, at least not at these larger markers that I can see. Um, and so I think this problem is to phrase it in the way that I'm gonna, I'm gonna point out maybe some different ways of thinking about it. It's, it's kind of like we have point in time clusters of difficult to reliably define behaviors that we say represent stable and specific causal factors that perfectly underlie a syndromal definition that we have specific treatments for over time. So that's what I mean by the diagnostic specificity primary. And we actually use it, we kind of guide treatment, even over the lifespan, I think we still fall back on this paradigm. We might say you were misdiagnosed, or we might say the diagnosis changed. We might do that, but we're still on this kind of like, you switch from internal pathology to internal pathology and have to specifically correct it over time. There's these assumptions packed into them. I just want to point out from a genetic standpoint, we really have 50 years of not much. To, to sort of think about so these syndromes, how, the, how do they track through populations? And just a couple of examples, this is easy to demonstrate. I'll give you one example from the early psychosis world, but the problem is our diagnoses just aren't that stable. Now, some of them are more stable, um, uh, uh, and the more severe they are, the more stable they tend to be. But even ones we consider severe, like let's say schizophrenia, if you look at 20 year trajectory, this is showing you positive symptoms. Look at the huge range of positive symptom outcomes for people who had an ICD-10 diagnosis of schizophrenia spectrum disorder 20 years later. That's basically going from no symptoms to, uh, to quite impairing symptoms. And you can see how some of them get better and worse. Some of them go away right away and stay right away. Some of them go away and come back and don't go away. There's all these things that you really, the diagnosis itself would not help you predict this. Um, and this is not a treatment effect, in fact, the antipsychotic use is more likely to be in the people who sustain the higher treatments. I'm not saying that's causal, but it, but it's not. this is not explained by people getting a specific treatment uh, and those are the ones whose the symptoms go away. In fact, those are the people who tend to be uh, least on antipsychotics. Um, so so just, just to show you just how unstable even a severe impairing just I think we would all assume, I even hear people still say schizophrenia, you need to take medication for life, right? Which is, I think is again, getting at this idea that these are stable specific diagnoses over time. Um, and then just, and, and really one thing I've learned, this is true in schizophrenia, I'll give you a depression example though. If you follow, we have a lot of treatments that, that are aligned with the diagnostic specificity paradigm because we, we, we screen out everybody who doesn't have anything but major depressive disorder. We give you a so-called antidepressant and your syndrome gets a little bit better. And so it's aligned with a specificity paradigm. The problem is if you follow people for long periods of time, you don't really see much alteration of course with these specific treatments. Um, so I'm just going to use STAR-D as one example, because I think uh, a lot of people, just a quick question, what did start, what was the take-home point from STAR-D, can we remember? Cumulative remission rate of about two-thirds, that's the take-home point, which sounds impressive, and actually, they're not lying, every time you, so if you, if you, you went into a couple months treatment, if you didn't respond, you went into another couple months treatment, and at any time during those treatments, if you got remission, it was about two-thirds of that time. The problem is if you follow all those people over time, you see this. What you see is that in any group, whatever group, whether they responded first or second or third, what you see is that the, if you wait another year, the relapse rate was higher than half for all of them. So the course wasn't really, and, and uh, by the end of the study, almost nobody stays well. So the study goes out to two years. Um, so what you can see is that, that this idea that I've specifically targeted a deficit that, is, that I've created a stable deficit correction over time doesn't hold up. So that, that's the kind of data that really argues against the diagnostic specificity paradigm as we currently apply it. So I wanna just end with some data that comes from the Dunedin birth cohort. So is it Dunedin, 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 I don't know. Dunedin, okay, thank you. It's, it's yeah, Irish or Scottish, right? Dunedin. I was gonna say Dunedin, but those are the Northern Rangers and Northern Rangers. Uh, but uh, so the Duna, Dunedin, Dunedin, sorry. That, that birth co cohort, so, so They've been doing since the 70s, just following people for long periods of time. Um, and, and they make a statement based upon the data I'm gonna show you that really progress in conception, and this is what I'm talking about conceptualizing mental disorders, has really been delayed by this focus on cross-sectional information, which is essentially what the DSM field trials focus on, right? cross-sectional information. And it's based upon this assumption that I, I hopefully told you doesn't really hold up that well, that, that that a diagnosis provides causal information that tailoring a treatment specifically will ensure a good response and a good prognosis. 
So uh, the study is longitudinal. It starts in 1972. So that's my birth year. So I have a good feeling about that. Um, um, they all played Atari with me. But uh, uh, what they do is, th what I like about this study is it's, it's prospective and it, it doesn't have too many hypotheses ahead of time. So it's really just saying, what if we just measured behavior behavioral disturbance over long periods of time, what would we find? The original, some of the original cannabis schizophrenia data come from this uh, because it, it actually, it actually, they were measuring it years before the onset of schizophrenia, which always a problem in cross-sectional studies is you're using memories of past use. And they, they assess pretty much all of the biggies, all of the, but now it starts with DSM-3. So there may be some disorders where the criteria switch a little bit. Um, but uh, my, one of my critiques of this, I think they should have started some of them a little bit earlier. Like they wait to assess schizophrenia until 21, so that's a problem. Um, but they're, I think you only have so much time, right? So they're, they're, you can see what they're doing. And, and they, they uh, at the time, epidemiologists had already separated externalizing, internalizing, and thought disorders as three distinct factor analyzed categories on a cross sectional basis. So they're curious, would these hold up over time? Would these, would these categories hold up over time? And the findings, I think they won't be surprising to people who have worked uh, with, with patients for decades, but I just wanna say, but the, the findings still just go against this idea of diagnostic specificity being the primary way to think about treating mental disturbance. Um, so first off, the lifetime risk was pretty high. Um, so uh, so people, people who at any point had not had a mental disorder was rare, that was the exception. So a lot of people go in and out of behavioral disturbance. Um, um, and I think in my world, I've kind of recognized this, but just to remind us all, right, the, the sort of adolescent and Tay group is where the vast majority of people who have their first episode of a behavioral syndrome are going to first show up. Um, so you can see it's 60% uh, by the age of 18 years. And then really all you have to do is go out to like age 25 and already you've gotten the vast majority, like 70 to 80% of uh, It's not that people don't develop uh, uh, behavioral disturbance afterwards. It's just that the, the chances go way down. Um, and so just some things I want to highlight. Uh, so the top left is showing you what I just told you is that the age of diagnosis, you can see that by the time we hit the mid twenties, the vast majority of the people who are going to get a diagnosis have already gotten a diagnosis. So again, useful, useful from a public health standpoint to think about the system in this way. And what the lower left is showing you is that contrary to our idea that you show a type, you come to me and you show a type, you're obsessive compulsive or you're schizophrenic or something like that. Um, the, uh, the, number of diagnoses that people had, a large percent of them ended up with five or more over the lifetime of the study. Um, and the earlier you were diagnosed, the chance that you would have more than one diagnosis goes up significantly. You can see that it's less than 10% of people who were diagnosed with adolescents who ended up having just one diagnosis over the lifespan. And again, people who've worked with people over years, I think, know this, but the, the specificity was low. Um, and this one surprised me the extent to which this was true. I guess I kind of expected this was true from my experience. Um, but these ideas that there are the depression, anxiety, ADHD, schizophrenia, that they're representing these genetic tracks does, does not hold up over time. In fact, the comorbidity between all diagnoses was very high. So it wasn't like they all clustered in the depressive anxiety cluster. They clustered in the thought disorder bipolar mania spectrum. It was that they, they crossed over again and again and again. Um, and and this is, to, to visually show this, this is showing every, I think there's a thousand participants, every participant uh, starting at age 11 when they first start doing behavioral measurements. So blue is no diagnosis at entry, and then yellow is one, you know, darker yellow is two, and it goes down to five or more. So you can see, what you see is really, though, that there is this severely affected cohort that's at the bottom. Usually, if you started with a lot of diagnoses, you were, you were likely to stay with a lot of diagnoses. But the rule is that a lot of people just go in and out of all the different levels, uh, to, to a degree that surprised me, honestly, even though I expected some instability. Um, and just look at the... Uh, the text on the right here, 605 of those 1,000 participants had a unique pattern over time. So there weren't, it, it was even hard to find a quote unquote, you know, sort of life pattern of severity over time. Um, and when you looked at the most severe people, so these are people who had ever required psychiatric inpatient treatment, all of them had a unique uh, pattern. There were, no, there, were no, there were no similarities between the 83 people at, at this level of analysis, which is changing diagnosis every five to 10 years. So it's kind of like, that's, that's why I say move to a management paradigm is it's, it's a little bit more humility about what's going to happen and a little bit more anticipation about all the different ways that people will move through the system. Um, and so I mentioned this before, but just, just, just this take home point, I want to hammer it. Every disorder was associated with elevated risk for every other disorder. It was very hard to find any specificity within that, which is just not the way we think, right? Our clinics are all set up on the idea 
that I've captured a cluster of genetically similar people who have a similar underlying psychopathology. That's what our specialty clinics are based upon that idea. Um, and virtually nobody keeps one pure diagnosis type. That was extremely rare. Um, uh, some people who had first onset in middle age or later would do that, but uh, uh, almost nobody else did. And so we talked a little bit, Andrea, you brought up expertise. And I just, I, when you think about, this is just, you know, if you Google expertise, you get, you know, and I've taken courses on leadership where we talk about these things and just think about, you know, so when you move from a novice to begin, I think you can apply this to medical school. So certainly you have to learn the categories first. And I don't expect you to have a ton of nuance on, on the different, you know, on sort of the gray areas. But you'd like to think that as we move from competency to proficient to expert, that we're starting to take these situations, we're perceiving situations as a whole, remember the lifespan whole, we're, we're thinking about, we're able to zoom in on certain aspects and, and clarify them and then zoom back out as necessary. I worry that the diagnostic specificity paradigm actually undermines our ability to move to these levels of competency and expertise because the assumptions packed in them actually move us away from taking the long view. Um, and so really the take home for me, I'll let you read it from the, um, the longitudinal study is this. So it brings up the interesting question, what if you organize your mental health care system around, we already do this a little bit, but what if we made it explicit? Age of onset, duration, diversity of syndrome, and severity. What if we just reorganize our system around those things? How would that look different? Well, I think it would look very different. You'd have a, you'd have a much more, we already, have, I know, I know we, we sort of do this with child that we think about it as moving through adolescence. We have this arbitrary 18 year old cutoff. Um, and so what if you actually just thought about the system as thinking about uh, management over time from a, from a lifespan perspective? And what if you thought, and I think that means instead of this idea of the individual specialist, what if you thought about interdisciplinary teams being the rule for early intervention in terms of people who are adolescent and young adults, because the diagnoses are gonna be so unstable and the severity is gonna be so unpredictable that the idea that they're gonna find quote unquote the right home right away, I think is problematic. So what if that was the rule as opposed to the exception? Um, and that individual clinicians would be more the rule uh, when people had, when you had, when you did have diagnostic stability by waiting. <laughs> By waiting over time, there were, it's not that there weren't diagnostic stability. It was just a, it was a it was a, a small percentage of it. Um, and I think this is another thing that our field doesn't do such a good job of. This paradigm suggests deprescribing is as important as prescribing. Uh, if people are going to go, if if, if we if we we know that the number needed to harm for antipsychotic medications is pretty abysmal, like seven or eight, right? So the number needed to treat is maybe what six or seven. So we should not be continuing people on medication with the assumption that we're correcting a specific deficit over a long period of time. That's just an assumption that I can't, cannot be justified um, by the data that I've showed you, in particular, if you're talking about a harmful medication. Um, and so uh, um, I'll, I'll, I just wanna briefly show this just because this is, this is something I wanted to do and I hope it's still possible is, is thinking about the Tay population as an extended assessment and staging team-based focus, as opposed to you call them and they figure out which clinic you're right for, which is kind of the way that it happens right now, at least in my world. Um, and just thinking about that as the rule and that we can tailor to your severity right away. You don't have to wait two months to get into the high acuity program. This program is designed for acuity right away. And then if you don't need acuity, then you go immediately to one of the spokes. This is a hub and spoke model of care. It's not that specific treatments aren't helpful, it's that, it's that the extended assessment is gonna be important to find out who's at the high risk over time and who needs the intervention now. Again, diagnosis being less important as the specific. So I know we're at time. So I'll, I'll let you read uh, sort of some of the challenges that I have to all of us and then, and then ending with a little bit of an expertise that I think will always be in demand. Thank you. Have a couple minutes. I'm happy to. I know folks have to go. David. Yeah, thank you for all that. I want to push you on one thing. Please. Um, and you kind of addressed this a little bit with the okay. deprescribing. But ultimately, we have these classes of medication. We have our antidepressants, antipsychotics, which are very much based on this very alternative and not as factually based set of information as we want but that's what we have to treat these people. Sure. How does this more cohesive childhood, you know, early young adult, 
does that change the way you prescribe? Does that change the classes of medications you draw on? I think it would, uh, it would make me think more about, good question, right? It's, and medication, I mean, just think about that. They're nonspecific, it doesn't mean they don't help, right? So nonspecific treatments can be helpful. Um, I, I would say that it, you're, you're much more humble about treating the behaviors and the problems as opposed to treating an underlying deficit. One of the assumptions I find problematic in my world is that if you've ever had psychosis, that's evidence that you have a dopamine deficit. That's evidence that you need to be in antipsychotic medications, even if you have no psychotic symptoms. I think you would just eschew that assumption entirely. And you'd be much more careful around, this is something that, because I've dove into this literature, be much more careful around, this is true for pain medication, this is true for GERD medications, true for a lot of medications. A lot of our medications, if you take them for years, they cause their own problems independent of why you started them. And I think you, if, you, if you have no evidence you're correcting a deficit, you have to be invested in that as a problem. Um, so those would be two, but that's why I say de-prescribing de become as, as important as prescribing. And probably you'd be prescribing them more for what they do as opposed to what they're supposed to correct. So I think the question is, when I give you an SSRI, sometimes we don't, I'm surprised sometimes we don't even have a lot of studies on just like quote unquote healthy controls. Like what do people say about what an SSRI does? Because that's probably what it's doing in everybody. It's not correcting a specific deficit. So that, I think that would be thinking about them more as uh, there's a name for this. It's like a, as opposed to diagnosis specific drug treatment, it's a, it's, it's a drug syndrome specific drug treatment where you just, what is the drugs, what it's syndrome does the drug induce? And is that a therapeutic in the context or not? As me. Okay. Time, we as a field have influenced pop culture to further reify this trap of meaning because I love what you're saying about treating the patients present and doing that, but all of our patients come to us with the idea that we do have special powers yes. and <laughs> deeply course. wanting us to reify some kind of meaning. And I feel like it's, if anything, it's gotten deeply worse with the internet and working with young people, everybody's coming in, having learned on TikTok that they have these specific diagnoses right. that they deeply want as a way to sort of shortcut to identity and as a shortcut into like a group right, which that from, they from belong to. From a developmental to. standpoint, is this, a lot of starting of identity starts with these kinds of broad categories. Right. Of I am this, right? I am yeah. This. So I'm curious your thoughts on like thinking about equity and thinking about advocacy, how, like in what ways as, as, you know, in an ideal world and, you know, we're, we're all in charge and we're, <laughs> we're making this pivot. How do we bring that to the broader culture and how do we undo some of, I think, the evils of early psychiatry and psychology and the honest missteps as well to try to break this up more broadly culturally. So I, I don't have a quick answer. I'll tell you how I try to address it in the individual because the tons, tons of young people come to me. I mean, even, even at the level of sort of this kind of scientism, right? This kind of like, I, I, I looked at Cymbalta and I think I might need it because of the norepinephrine, yada, yada, right? Mm -hmm. right? And, and um, what, what I try to do is, is I try to just be proactive about what I think my expertise is, because I think you need to demonstrate that first. If you lead with all oh, these diagnoses, blah, blah, I, I think you lose people, right? you lose people pretty quickly. So I try to lead with what my expertise is, is. And my expertise is often, I've seen this before, I've managed this over long periods of time. I think we can help you. Here's why I think we can help you. And I wish our field led more like that, as opposed, sometimes I feel like we lead with like, mental disorders are real which I think is an anti-stigma campaign. And I'm not, it's not like I'm against it, but I'm not sure that's the way to lead your expertise, right? It's a constantly being argued, like, like what's the larger message if all you're saying is, I treat real stuff, I treat real stuff. It doesn't sound to me, it sounds to me like you're being defensive. It doesn't sound to me like you have something to offer me. Um, and that, that's, but I, don't, but I don't, how our field would do that? I don't know, I don't know. Uh, so, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Eduardo. Um, I am. This is my second day here. <laughs> I'm very <Welcome>. excited. <laughs> um, so I keep on thinking in my mind of of a very personal story. So someone in my family um, has has had a psychotic break. Um, they're getting treated in my hometown, um, where there is no. I think there's like a psychiatrist that comes like once a month. Um, so. I, I love this conversation 
in a room full of experts, how do we disseminate this message to places that don't have that expertise? Yeah, no, thank you for that question. Uh, right, and, and it's, a, it's one that's often, because I'm in this world, it's kind of off my radar, I have to remind myself of it. I, I mean, I, but this is just kind of off the cuff a little bit wider, but because, because I've, I've become a big believer in coordinated specialty team care. And it's not, it's not so much, it's not just because we're all experts on schizophrenia, which we end up being. It's, it's more because I think it's just a better way. It's a better way to serve a population where, where the, the, in my experience, the, the vast majority of the good outcomes don't need to have a medical doctor involved, but a medical doctor as part of the team is helpful or a PhD psychologist, I think would be a similar analogy depending on the system. And so I'd, I'd like to see that this idea that you know, this kind of wait till you see the expert or wait till the expert comes to town, as opposed to thinking about the, the local support, because I, I think 80 to 90% of outcome is gonna be independent of a medical degree, honestly. And, and so, how, but the system doesn't think about it that way. The system thinks about, you know, oh, I can't do anything until we see the psychiatrist. That's how the system thinks about it. And so I'd like to think about more of the psychiatrists becoming more leaders in sort of actually, and actually guiding that. Right, guiding that team-based approach. That's why I think a, a team-based approach would be in particular for early onset disorders. Yeah. But I mean, these are, these are the kinds of questions, honestly, I mean, I've just started thinking about these. I don't, I don't have any, this is not an answers talk. Yeah. All right, we're at time. I'm happy to stick around if folks have other comments. Thanks for being here with me on a Tuesday morning.